Good morning again. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Good morning. And a bonus co-host yeah. to begin the 9 o'clock hour, Tony Petrucci hanging out. Now, Matt, you initially pointed out Uh-oh. this would be two Italians I'm, versus two Mets. I messed Mets. up. The, <laughs> yeah, I see that now. The scales, down my list. the scales are tilting, baby, because I'm bringing in a Ferretti now I'd like to, to go buy, with the Petrucci. I'd like to buy a vowel. Yeah, right? Huh? <laughs> you can't, Vanna. You can't do it. Yeah. Uh, although uh, sometimes I'm why does the, qualify I'm, sometimes. Yes, that's yeah. right. A-E-I-O-U right. and sometimes why. That leaves you out in the cold, Miller. <laughs> <laughs> and Colin, our producer, is part Italian too. On his uh, dad's side, I think his, uh, his uh, grandmother on his dad's side is Italian. So I'm adding up the people on my side of the ledger here this morning. <laughs> Joe, good morning to you, sir. How are you doing there in Georgia? Uh, we're doing okay, as best I can say right now. But uh, uh, h- hello to everybody, and of course my old friend Tony Petrucci. Nice to uh, Hi, hear Joe. from you again, Tony. Hi, Joe. I hope everything's well down that area. I know it's uh, been very difficult. Uh, trying times, Tony. Uh, there's a lot of folks uh, in this state and in Western North Carolina that are going to have months of recovery. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're so, praying for you, buddy. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Joey, the uh, highway signs on I-81, the flashing overhead signs, warn people about travel to western North Carolina, and that's a sign that's here in Martinsburg, West Virginia, as you're yeah. crossing over yeah. the bridge uh, over the Potomac from Maryland into West Virginia. Those signs are flashing that for the truckers, I presume, and anyone on uh, long travel down I-81 southbound. In a text you sent to me last week, you said that the eye of the hurricane passed right over your house. Can you describe that time? It was, it, was it nighttime and what was going on? Yeah. It, 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 Rob, this storm, uh, of course, look, I'm, as you know, I'm a Western PA boy and, and lived a lot of my life in, the, in West Virginia. And uh, this is all new to me, uh, dealing with a hurricane. Uh, and, and understand this, I am 360 miles from any coastline. Uh, I mean, that, that's like Martinsburg to Charlotte, North Carolina. That's the distance we're talking about here where I live in Georgia relative to any coastline. And when this storm uh, went up into the Big Bend area of Florida at about 11 o'clock at night on uh, Thursday night, uh, we were warned here the forward movement of the storm is going to be very rapid. And so by 2 to 3 a.m., just four hours, uh, uh, three to four hours after this storm made landfall in Florida, we were feeling the effects of it. Of course, it was a massive storm, uh, very broad in, in terms of its uh, geographical coverage. And it came roaring up through here at 35 to 40 miles per hour northward. And uh, we started getting warnings about 2 to 2.30, you know, please seek shelter. You're going to have 80 to 90 mile per hour winds. This is still going to be a Category 1 to Category 2 storm in central Georgia. And so I woke up my wife. I said, we, we better sleep in the basement because we've got some very, very tall, very big pine trees in our yard. Uh, they call them widow makers here because if they fall and hit your house, uh, it, it, it can be a real problem. So we scurried to the basement and I logged on to the Internet. And I didn't sleep a wink uh, Thursday night, Friday morning. I, I was up all night watching the radar and just uh, dealing with this. And, Rob, when that eye went over our home, I actually went outside, and it was very eerie because it was so calm. The rain had stopped. The wind had stopped. And you would have never known that a Category 1 hurricane was overhead. It was really strange. And it lasted that way for about a good 45 minutes where it was just as calm as any summer night can be down here. And then before you know it, the wind started picking up again when that southern eye wall came over the area. And, of course, I scurried back in the house and just hunkered down for the rest of the night. How long did the entire experience last, Joe? Well, we had uh, we had hurricane-force winds for about six hours total here. Uh, and, and we were fortunate in this area. I, I sustained very little damage uh, here. I, I, and it's... I mean, it's remarkable. I can, you can drive here 35, 40 miles to the east towards Augusta, which I'm, I'm sure you've all heard was, was hammered pretty bad. Uh, I, I, you can drive 
just 35, 40 miles east and see trees down everywhere, almost like a tornado had gone through. And, and the flooding was, was really bad over that way. And it's kind of the dynamics of the storm. Remember, this is, it's, it's turning counterclockwise, the winds are, around the eye. And those are your strongest winds, of course. And they're 80, 90 miles per hour over central Georgia. And as this thing is moving north, the northward movement is counteracting the winds in the northern, western, and southern quadrants of the eye. Okay, so it's actually lessening the winds because of the northward movement. But it's accelerating the eastern eye wall winds because the movement north is actually adding to the speeds of the winds in the eye wall. So over in Augusta, Georgia, and Sparta, Georgia, Again, 35 to 50 miles from here, which is, it's, as you sit in Martinsburg, you're talking about Leesburg over to maybe Dulles Airport. That far away from my home, they experience winds over 100 miles an hour. And that's why Augusta is basically leveled and flooded today and is not expecting power to be restored for another two weeks. Matt Miller. I'm just taken back listening to all of that. I've heard that about the eye of the storm and the calmness in the middle. Did you notice at all, was there more violence, if you will, in the storm as it came through the first time or the backside of it after the eye went over your house? Yeah, when, when the northern eye wall hit here, that's when the winds really picked up and you knew you were in a hurricane. I mean, I looked outside and, Matt, I have trees that are you know 50 feet, 60 feet tall. And uh, I'm watching them sway back and forth like they're weeds. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know, I'm just wondering how long they're going to stay up. Uh, and you can hear the house creaking a little bit as, you know, the winds are just buffeting your home. Uh, the eye wall came across and we had that 45 minutes of calm. And then the wind started picking up again. And it was just consistent here about, I think our regional airport clocked about 50 to 60 mile per hour gusts to 75 in this area. Uh, and like I said, east of here, 30 mile per hour is more. Uh, but it, it, um, it's a harrowing experience. I, I can't imagine these people in Florida would get warnings that e even just a category one hurricane is about to hit the coast. I can't imagine those people choosing to stay behind because it, it's, um, it's something that you just don't want to experience because you, you just feel like at some point everything's going to fall apart. Uh, trees and your home and everything else. I secured all my uh, furniture outside the house that we have on our decks and all just to make sure it's not blowing around and crashing in the windows. Uh, it takes a lot of prep and uh, a lot of prayer. As scary as I can imagine the winds are, what was the rain like? We got torrential rain here. I think it was measured... Uh, at 9 to 10 inches total for the storm because the rain came a lot uh, sooner than the eye wall course and it lasted a lot longer after the uh, storm was gone and moved up into western North Carolina. Atlanta had, uh, and Atlanta's 70 miles to my west, they had uh, rain in amounts uh, over 48 hours that they've never had in the history of measuring rainfall in Atlanta. Augusta had I think it was 14 to 15 inches of rain in 48 hours. And, of course, uh, what's really horrific is uh, once the storm went up into western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee, it kind of sat there, and it just rained constantly for a whole day. And that's they're measuring rain up there in, in feet. Uh, I've heard upwards of 25 to 30 inches of rain in parts of uh, western North Carolina. People talked about how quickly the rain came, Joe, and just, swept people away there's still so many people missing and an amazing number of people who have died from this storm well I, i've been to north western north carolina a good bit I, there's some great trout fishing up there and uh I, it's it reminds you of central west virginia in terms of the mountains and the hollows and how a lot of the roads and creeks just you know wind through the hollows and so uh, you, uh, people in West Virginia, I'm sure, remember the 1985 flood and, and what that w did to West Virginia. And, of course, and I think it was in 2016, we had another major flooding event in West Virginia. Yeah, houses, people, pets, things get swept away. Uh, I, I believe the death toll now is up over 200, and there's still 
uh, many more people missing and unaccounted for, especially in western North Carolina. Hey, Armour, it's uh, nearly 31 inches of rain in one particular town in western North Carolina. Matt Harvey? Um, I'm very curious to hear about the emergency response. The the, uh, the emergency response has been very good. Uh, our governor in Georgia, who I like a lot, Governor Kemp, uh, he mobilized the uh, National Guard immediately. Uh, and unfortunate, Matt, you, and I, I know you <laughs> – you understand this all too well. Uh, once these events occur, uh, it's not long after the event uh, that people start looting and, and behaving poorly. Uh, so he got the National Guard involved immediately to secure uh, stores and to secure people's uh, property. Uh, the American Red Cross was here immediately with uh, supplies. And, of course, they bring in life-sustaining supplies like water uh and uh and of course the uh, manpower to help clear debris and, and get things moving uh long term uh a lot of charities now are stepping up and and rob before we conclude this segment i'll, I'll just list a couple that uh, if anybody's interested in in donating uh there's a couple of really good charities who have been vetted and, and rated very highly who are leading the response in many of these communities where people are suffering but uh overall uh Matt, the, the, the uh, emergency response has been very good. I've been very impressed with it. There's a lot of injuries, uh, a lot of elderly people who need to be moved uh, to higher ground or to places where they can continue to receive their, their daily medical care. And these folks have been heroic in their efforts to do uh, a lot of that work. Tony Petrucci. Uh, Joe, I guess my biggest thing is, you know, up there around the North Carolina area, I mean, some of those towns are just, they're gone. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing there. And you're just wondering how in the world, you know, will they ever recover? I mean, I know they will, but it's, uh, it's just devastating when you look at that. And, and I, I just really can't fathom it. That, that's, uh, it's that, is that bad? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tony, it reminds me of 1985. Yeah, uh, yeah. When the towns of Albright and uh, and places over along the Cheat River Valley yeah. were wiped out, uh, scoured clean. Uh, you would go downtown and there would be just remnants of buildings and, and just foundations uh, when the Cheat River roared through that area. Uh, and I, it, it, you can go to Albright today. And uh, uh, which is just north of Tucker County over in, in West Virginia. And, and you can see still uh, remnants of that 1985 flood. Uh, and and uh, cause it, yeah, people build back, but not completely. Uh, yeah. Insurance only covers so much. Um, what's your opinion on, you know, there was some talk of, of FEMA and the federal government having their uh, equipment there prior prior to all this, you know, sort of being a pre-plan type situation. Um, could that have been done? You know, with water, with, with uh, whatever. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, they had a good idea, uh, and we were hearing on reports here that the path of this hurricane, uh, they had pretty well settled on about 24 to 36 hours prior to landfall. Uh, and their act, their predictions were pretty accurate in terms of the path. It did wobble a little bit. It did move a little bit further east here in Georgia than it was anticipated. Uh, but they had a pretty good idea this was going to go into the uh, Smoky Mountains, uh, eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, and it was going to become stationary there and just pour down the rain. Uh, so I suspect that some preparations were done in advance. I, 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 I'm sure we'll re examine that situation and decide whether other decisions could have been made or made more correctly. Uh, but it, it's it's really hard to anticipate. I mean, they call it flash floods for a reason, right? I mean, it, yeah. it, it just happens out of nowhere. And, yeah. and so in many respects, uh, a lot of this is unpredictable. Absolutely. You know, I heard this morning in a report, Joe, that FEMA has, because of the size and scope of this disaster, FEMA has enough money for this disaster, and then that's it. And this yeah. isn't the end of hurricane season yet, so they're concerned about more storms coming through and not having enough funding for it. Yeah, I see where 
Harris is distributing seven hundred and fifty dollars to families that you know right away that need mm-hmm. something you know that food water whatever um that was mentioned yesterday at the press conference at right. on the radio on TV. So, Man, yeah, that, and I have that, a I have a recollection that that happened with Katrina too, because of the the, mm-hmm. the scale and scope of the damage uh, with that particular storm. That uh, FEMA was stressed to the max in terms yeah. of having the resources yeah, to just, respond. If if God forbid any other storm like this comes through. Your dad worked for FEMA, Matt, did you not? Yeah, yeah, my dad was with FEMA for about 19 years, and uh, back when, uh, which one, Katrina, I guess it was, that came through New Orleans, and everything got shifted down to Houston, Texas. He was actually there at the uh, the Dome in Houston helping to do coordination efforts and those kind of things. And so he's been around a lot of these types of, of events, um, you know, trying to deal with the aftermath. And uh, certainly a challenge. Good grief. A uh, huge, huge challenge. Joe, I wanted to ask, w- were there any notices for evacuation in the area where you are or close by? Or was there ever even a thought in your own mind to say, you know, to your wife, hey, maybe we need to get out of here? Well, I, 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 it's funny you ask that question because, of course, number one, uh, me never having lived through something like this. <laughs> I, I, it, my first thought wasn't to evacuate, but then I, I was sitting and saying, you know, this home is not safe because if we get these high winds with these big trees around my house, uh, even if I'm, I'm downstairs in my in my bottom floor of my home, I, I'm not feeling safe. I mean, these are pretty large trees. And I was thinking maybe I should drive somewhere and just sit in an open parking lot in my car where there's no trees or no risk of being uh hit with the flying debris. Uh, so these thoughts kind of run through your head, but it, it's amazing that, that, you know, the storm came forth so quickly. It moved so rapidly north that there wasn't a lot of time for deliberation. So all the only prep I was able to do was to make sure I had batteries, to make sure I had, uh, assuming that I might not have power for days or weeks, make sure I had the ability to, uh, have a heat source to prepare meals. Uh, right now, one of the biggest items being requested for people who were in the path of the of the major part of this storm who felt the most impact is charcoal. Uh, people are dying to buy charcoal or get charcoal, and they and a lot of these relief organizations are asking for donations of charcoal and charcoal uh, lighter fluid because that's how people are able to prepare food. Uh, they just don't have the power or the gas to do uh, food prep. So, uh, you know, it's items like that that you, I, I had to make sure I had, and of course I have a portable generator so I could I could plug in my refrigerator and run my little 2000 kilowatt uh, generator and, and keep it going. But uh, uh, other than that, you know, there, there were no suggestions that we go anywhere in this area. We were just told to hunker down and make sure you're in a secure location. Did you feel at any point along the way like your house was falling apart or about to be ripped apart or come down? No, I just heard a little creaking, like, you know, just a little stress on the home. Um, uh, I would have been calling my contractor about the quality of the home if something had happened, given the, the, the winds that we experienced, which, again, we're only uh, fortunately here 50 to 60 mile per hour. Uh, but th- there's no amount of quality construction that's going to have a home withstand uh, 100 mile plus uh, wind speeds, and uh, unfortunately, that's what the uh, folks of Augusta experienced. You know, I'm, I'm looking at that hurricane's path. I don't remember another hurricane doing that in my lifetime, Joe. Usually, they'll, if, they, if they come up through Florida, they'll spin up the East Coast, or they'll cut across Florida and go into the Gulf, and then and it'll go up through Texas. I don't remember a hurricane, you know, uh, coming up through Georgia and then sitting in the Carolinas and just dumping rain like that. Is there precedent for this? Well, not really. I, I talked to a lot of folks who have lived here a lot longer than I have because I'm, I'm just entering my fourth year. Uh, and, and I said, boy, I never thought I was moving into a hurricane area. And they said, oh, no, this this is so rare that here, again, we're 360 miles from the coast. Most of the storms that, that come ashore uh, in the Gulf or in Florida and then head up through Georgia, they dissipate quickly. And by the time they get here, they're just you know low pressures or at at worst, 
a tropical depression and, and your wind speeds are 30, 35 miles per hour and, and you get four or five inches of rain and it's gone. And I've experienced that here already with some hurricanes in the past few years. Uh, they just dissipate quickly. They, but this one was large and moved forward so quickly that it was able to maintain its strength for a long period of time. And that's why I think for the first time in anybody's memory around here, we had a, a Category 1 to Category 2 hurricane overhead. What is the future of the insurance industry? And you work with insurance companies, Joe, as an attorney, and oh, so, yeah. sometimes in an adversarial <laughs> manner. I think <laughs> most I times. I used to represent them. Yeah. I used to represent them. Uh, Rob, good question. And I'll tell you, um, uh, talking to folks who I know uh, live in Florida or who live here and spend uh, the winter months down there, uh, they're telling me that the Florida insurance market is just, uh, it's crazy bad. Uh, you, you, you can't get it. A lot of companies have pulled out. Uh, I think after last hurricane season, last year, 2023, I think there were 13 insurance companies which pulled out of Florida completely. Uh, so there's only a handful left. Uh, and, and I know uh, somebody who has a home over in Savannah, Georgia, which Again, it's over 300 miles from here. They got some of this storm and some damage over there because they're right along the coast. So they had flooding issues. And I know somebody who bought a home over there in a very nice golf community. He had to go to Lloyd's of London to get a homeowner's policy. And I'm sure he paid through the nose for it. But in coastal areas all over this country right now, people are scrambling to find insurance. And uh, uh, these storms, as, as they get worse, as the damage uh, totals go up significantly, uh, I can see we're, we're going to continue to have a problem, and it's probably going to get worse in terms of securing that kind of insurance. We've, we've heard even here in West Virginia, um, you know, from the Attorney General's office, be aware of scams, people who will use this and say, hey, send money to help, and they're taking You yes. mentioned earlier you had some, some suggestions. Can you give us those? Yes. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, a, a couple that, that I have done some research on, and, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, so probably people have heard of these before, but they are the most reputable, the most highly rated. Of course, the Red Cross, uh, you can just do redcross.org. Uh, they're, they're on the ground already here. Operation Blessing, which is a nonprofit, highly rated organization. If you just Google that, uh, uh, that, name operation blessing they are accepting donations and right now most of the donations they want are monetary they're still trying to assess on the ground what the needs are for these folks but uh right now it's money uh in order to uh secure supplies and to get people in there who are going to start doing the work of of uh, repairing things uh world central kitchen is another one which is uh on the ground preparing food and meals for people who don't have the ability. Uh, remember I talked about uh, the need for charcoal. Uh, a lot of people don't even have that. So they have no way, uh, they have canned goods, but you know, you're not gonna eat it out of a can. So uh, World Central Kitchen is helping people prepare meals on the ground. And then Hickory Regional Airport. If you Google them, uh, that's a regional airport in Western North Carolina. That is a staging area for a lot of re- relief supplies that are going to go into the hollows and the uh, uh, the communities located along the creeks that flooded in western North Carolina. That's where a lot of supplies are going through. If you contact them, uh, they'll let you know how you can perhaps uh, accumulate supplies in your area and get them sent to that area. What these organizations do not want and what the National Guard and others do not want are people picking up and saying, you know, hey, my church organization is going to get together and we're going to go down there and help. Right now, they don't need that. They need the roads clear so they can bring in supplies. They don't want to have to be dealing with church groups and organizations showing up saying, we're here to help. we got our rubber gloves on. Where do we go? Uh, Joe, we're not ready for that yet. On that note, i got a break. I appreciate your help today on the program relating these experiences. We'll talk with you again tomorrow morning, sir. Great, Rob. Look forward to it.